with us and our job is to um, preserve hope for ourselves and for the next generation. But before I talk more about stories, I have to talk about what justice really is because it's actually a complicated idea. Uh, unless justice is concrete, it's merely a word, it's a wasted word, it's a deceptive word. But the rule of law, or justice, uh, is a governing and essential principle for a dignified society. And I need to explain it and how it links into our ideas about writing. The rule of law has to be much more than what is written on paper. Because if it's written on paper, um, but it can't be accessed, or if it's not applied, then it's just meaningless. And the way to think about the rule of law in every society all around the world, it's one of those small number of ideas which should exist in the same way all around the world. The way to think of it is as a bundle of ideas. Not just one or two sentences, but a bundle of ideas. And to the extent that those ideas are followed, the rule of law is either weak or strong, sick or healthy in our societies with um, many serious consequences depending on whether the rule of law is sick or healthy. Um, it's not what's on the statute book that matters. Many countries and over time, um, places where there's been tyranny and suffering and corruption have lovely laws on the statute books fine constitutions filled with majestic ideas. But it's not the words on the page that matter, it's what actually happens. And when I was writing that, I immediately think of the French Revolution and the Declaration of the Rights of Man in 1789. Fine words, great rights, but immediately followed by terrible uh, slaughter and mayhem. So what does this idea mean all around the world, the rule of law? It means doing justice without fear or favour, treating all people as equal. That's one of the ideas in the bundle. It means that people don't pay taxes unless they've got a, some way of saying how the taxes are spent. And we can call that, amongst other things, one of the key aspects of democracy. It means that if you have property, that you have security of title that the state or the government is not free to enter your home except under the order of a court with a warrant. The state is not free to work with big business and just come and force you off your land or out of your house. I remember years ago I was in India in uh, Bihar, which is the poorest area of India, and I was in the jungle where the Santals are, the tribal people called the Santals, and the government and corporations had come. These people were extremely poor, no education, and uh, a company had bought their land off them, the land that they'd been on since time immemorial. And they'd signed away their land with a thumbprint um, for, a, for a few hundred dollars, which at the time seemed to them a huge amount of money. And suddenly, for the first time since human memory, they were without land. And what I was seeing was their children some of them as young as five-year-old children going into the coal mines and carrying out the coal on baskets on their little heads. Uh, that's what happens when the rule of law breaks down and sadly investors often team up with local exploiters but that's a subject for another day. The rule of law, it means that court cases are decided by impartial judges on their merits where reasons are given for judgment reasons which are rational and transparent so that the people who win the case and the people who lose the case understand why. This is of great importance because that brings respect for the law. If you win or lose but you understand why, you and your community, your family and your friends will have respect, not disrespect. The rule of law means that outside influences such as politicians or political forces or religious forces or corporations do not affect the impartial and unbiased decisions of judges. This brings certainty and reliability 
and confidence to commercial activities and to criminal trials. Outcomes are predictable according to the rules of the land. It means decisions are enforceable. If the court makes a decision, that steps must be taken. It means that if you're prosecuted, then you know the charge, that you have a right to a defence, that you are free from torture and intimidation, that you have a right to bring witnesses. All of these ideas are not only new, uh, not only old but current, uh, go back at least to the American Bill of Rights, which is now 230 or more years old. But they're also found in the, United, in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which is nearly 70 years old. It's written into virtually every language in the world, and in its preamble it says, it's essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse to rebellion against tyranny, it's essential that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. And when those words are written in 1948, that was a crystallisation of some 200 years of struggle and change and education and war. And I'll come back to it, but critical to the international acceptance of that principle was literature and writing, because it was the development of community understanding and empathy with those issues which led to them being adopted as universal principles slowly over time through campaigns such as the abolition of slavery, uh, the emancipation of women in some countries. And it now has 8,000 people on death row being lined up to be executed. So surely there's a role in all this for writers. Writers have to bring memory to this generation and the next generation. The absence of memory is fatal for humanity. Would America have rushed into the war in Iraq and Afghanistan if it had remembered enough about the 20th century. It's been written that one of the reasons that America is in those wars and rushed into them is unlike other countries, such as all of the countries in Asia and Europe, where millions of people died during the 20th century, countless millions. In Europe, possibly 100 million, and in this part of the world, I don't know how many, but tens of millions. Civilians, not soldiers, civilians died in the 20th century wars but strangely, in the USA, only a tiny number of civilians actually died in 20th century wars. And some people say, well, that lack of memory of the brutality and the harshness of war, that lack of memory is what allowed America to make the mistakes that they made at the beginning of this century, to go into other wars so willingly and easily. And I suspect very strongly that only a population without memory 
could think that Donald Trump was a man worthy of high office. But when you contrast that lack of memory with literature and arts, such as is that actually happening with death penalty in America, more and more people understand the corruption, the failures and so on, because more and more is being written about it, plays, books, films and so on, that America is state by state actually abolishing the death penalty and will probably abolish it altogether in the foreseeable future. When I was testing these ideas, we have, there's undoubtedly, we have a great system of law. The rule of law is strong in Australia. All those tests which I read out before apply in Australia. But even so, we still have some terrible injustices. And I just want to explore that with you for a moment. Uh, terrible injustices concerning the Australian Aborigines. Strangely, two of the most important documents in contemporary Australia about Australian Aborigines come from speeches by Prime Ministers, which we wouldn't normally expect. Kevin Rudd was our Prime Minister in 2008. He's actually well known in Asia because he's fluent in Mandarin and lived in Asia. And he was Prime Minister seven years ago. And in February 2008 he gave a speech and the whole nation pretty much stopped for the speech. It was called the Sorry Speech. And he spoke about how there'd been terrible injustices against the Aborigine people, Aboriginal people. He spoke about what we call the stolen generation, how for many years in the 20th century, government would come and take children from families, Aboriginal families. The children would be screaming, the families would be screaming. And the idea was to take the children away and put them in um, situations which the government thought would be better for them. And often it was connected with the idea that they should be white, not black. They should be removed from um, poverty and black culture and placed in missions or in homes as servants and so on. And it's estimated that some 50,000 children were taken from homes in this way. And only very recently in Australia have we begun to understand and acknowledge the significance of that. In his speech he said, there comes a time in the history of nations when their peoples must become fully reconciled to their past if they are to go forward with confidence to embrace the future. And I would say to this audience, that reconciliation lies especially in the hands of artists, of writers and painters and so on. And it's not just Australia, but it's a universal idea. For us to be reconciled with our past, whichever country we come from, we need writers to explain it to us, whether it's fiction, whether it's plays or poetry. There was another famous speech in 1992 by another Prime Minister called Paul Keating. Paul Keating is also well known in Asia because as Treasurer and Prime Minister, he turned Australia looking towards England and turned Australia looking uh, to the Western countries to Asia. So we must be Asian focused. And so that was a, a big step in Australia's history. And he gave a speech at Redfern. It's called the Redfern Speech. Redfern's a suburb in Sydney where the Aboriginals were living. And it's a strange suburb back then because it was very poor. It was like a slum in the middle of a rich city. It was a very incongruous place. It's a famous word in Australia to talk about Redfern. And in his speech, he went through the tragedies that had been inflicted on the Aboriginal people. And he said many times, imagine, imagine if these terrible injustices had happened to you. And of course, it was a plea to people like yourselves, to writers, to help us imagine that in order to become reconciled with the problems of the past. It might be hard to explain to an audience outside Australia how much injustice there is in our Aboriginal communities, but just to give you an idea, the infant mortality is far worse than for non-Aborigines. Uh, adults have a much less life expectancy. Aborigines make up 3% of the population of the whole country, 3%, but make up 25% of the people in jail. A young Aboriginal is 31 times more likely to be jailed than a non-Aboriginal young person. 
and many of these statistics are actually getting worse rather than better over time. So it's a serious injustice that we have in our country.